a very warm welcome and good evening to our dear CCI family. I welcome each and everyone to today's webinar, which is a highly awaited topic that is from being familiar to being comfortable with immunosuppressants. I'm so happy that Dr. Krishna chose this topic. And this is a topic that I personally feel the topic evolves as we evolve in our practice. We start with the immunosuppressants that we have seen our teachers use. And as we grow in our practice, we experiment more and we learn more. And we try to do as much we can for the patient. But the primary, uh, I think, concern is always to do no harm. And immunosuppressants are a double-edged sword. So without further ado, let me welcome our wonderful panelists today. We have, first of all, the moderator, the master teacher himself, Dr. S.K. Uh, Chhabra, sir. Dr. Chhabra is the ex-director of pulmonology at VP Chess New Delhi. And he's currently the director of pulmonology at Primus Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi. Welcome, Dr. Chhabra, sir. Next, I would like to invite and welcome my favorite's favorite, which means my husband's favorite, Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. And uh, sir is senior pulmonologist at Nirayan Hidalya, Bengaluru. And we are always happy to learn from sir. Most welcome, Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. I would like to welcome our guest, rheumatologist today, Dr. Ankit Patwari. Dr. Ankit is a DM rheumatology practicing at Apollo Guwahati from Assam. Welcome, Dr. Ankit. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Devajyoti Bhattacharya, sir. Sir is the ex-professor and head of pulmonology at AFMC Pune, currently the director of pulmonology, professor and head at ILBS. Welcome, Dr. Deva Jyoti, sir. Thank you, madam. May I also invite and welcome Dr. Asha, who is at GKNM uh, Hospital, senior resident at GKNM Point Batur. And we are very happy to have a budding pulmonologist with us. Welcome, Dr. Asha. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Dr. Kapil Ayer, our transplant pulmonologist. Dr. Uh, Kapil, I think it's sufficient to say that sir is from Ahmedabad because uh, there are such few transplant pulmonologists all over India that, you know, the state belongs to you. So should I say from Ahmedabad or maybe from Gujarat? Mm -hmm. Welcome, Dr. Kapil Ayer. Uh, now, may I hand over to Dr. S.K. Chhabra, sir, and invite sir to take over. Sir is the moderator for today's event. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kirat. Uh, very good evening to all, all those who have signed in to listen to our panel discussion and those who will be signing in mm -hmm. further. Uh, this is a very, very interesting topic. And when uh, I was told to moderate it, I immediately accepted. The reason is that it is a challenging topic. You know, it's not something that you can download from an internet and make some slides or some questions. The topic is so vast that you have to read the textbook of respiratory medicine to discuss today's topic. You know, immunosuppression, that is important in practically all the diseases that we read about manage day to day in our clinical practice. And this is something which even today, those who have uh, signed in and who are not uh, listening to this discussion, today itself they would have given so many prescriptions of immunosuppressants. Right? So this is something that we pres prescribe every day. And there are so many questions. And this being the era of uh, knowledge through internet, even patients are aware. So they would always question their doctor, doctor, this drug you are writing for me, can I tolerate, is it necessary? So this discussion is always going to be there with us. And as 
Dr. Kira said that new agents are coming in and as we learn more and more about the use, we also need to understand that these are double-edged sports. Why do we use immunosuppressants? After all, immunity is something considered good, right? That is our general impression. But too much of a good thing is not good. And sometimes our own immunity attacks our own body and that creates problems. So we have to control runaway immune responses and that is where immunomodulation comes in. But too much of immunomodulation can harm because these are double-edged solutions. And although uh, one would like to believe that all aspects of immunomodulation are well standardized, the protocols, the dosing, management of complications, monitoring, but it is not so. So we need to update our knowledge, discuss, because many of these things are learned on the job when one is in practice treating patients. And our today's panel is, as usual, a delight to have. We have very senior persons, beginning with Dr. Murli Mohan. And the best thing about uh, doing a webinar with Dr. Murli Mohan is that when you see the huge stack of books behind his back, then it is very intimidating that he would have read all of those. You know, it's something like you see an advocate and you see stacks of books left. It's just see Dr. Mohan's background. No? no scenery or anything behind there, just books and books and books. <laughs> then we have another senior person, Dr. Bhattacharya. So on one extreme, we have experienced people. Then we have uh, middle level people who are growing, already made our name, but we'll grow further, Kirat and Kapil. And then we have, as per CCI's policy, a very young budding pulmonologist, Dr. Asha, who is a senior resident. So one should never underestimate junior residents and senior residents because they are the ones who are bubbling with knowledge and what they can teach seniors is sometimes unbelievable. So an excellent panel and just to go through what we will be discussing, we will be discussing firstly the most well-known immunosuppressant that is corticosteroids long-term oral corticosteroids. You know, inhaled corticosteroids are also anti-inflammatory, but not so much of immunosuppressant. So when we talk of immunosuppressant, then we are really referring to long-term oral corticosteroids. There are different diseases where these are used. So how these are used, what is the protocol, what is the dosing that should be given to these patients, especially in relation to connective tissue disease and for which we have an expert who is our guest. So in a field of pulmonologists, we have a guest rheumatologist and it's our pleasure to welcome him. Then when we use steroids, sometimes it becomes necessary to add another agent or a substitute so that doses of steroids can be reduced because steroids are well known to have adverse effects. So there are different kinds of steroid sparing or add-on drugs which are eventually going to be used. Sometimes from day one, sometimes after some time, these are added. Oral steroids, the complications are very well known. Any educated patient who comes to your clinic on long-term steroid, he'll ask you questions about whether it's going to harm my bones, my GI tract, how will it alter my blood glucose control? Because many of these patients also have comorbidities and we have to understand how we manage these patients. And then how we monitor our medicines. You know, all the drugs that we use, especially the corticosteroid sparing agents, they have uh, protocols of monitoring, like every 15 days or a month you have to do liver functions, blood counts, so that they can be stopped or dose can be reduced before uh, damage is done. Comorbidities can get derailed when these patients are, are on treatment. You know, patients who have diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, peptic ulcer disease, the control can go haywire. And sometimes primary disease doesn't hurt that much, but the complication and management of comorbidities takes its toll. So patients have to worry about that also. Then monitoring of these drugs, the steroid sparing agents that we'll discuss. 
Now, when we talk of uh, immunosuppression, mostly we'll discuss chronic conditions, but there are acute conditions also where these drugs have to be used. Most recently, we have come through the COVID pandemic where steroids were used in plenty. There are debates on when to start, what is the right dose, high dose, low dose. Then tuberculosis. We tend to believe that steroids and anti-tubercular treatment are the opposite poles, but there are conditions in tuberculosis itself where we have to use steroids. So it's not that steroids are contraindicated in tuberculosis. Then when these patients are on immunosuppressive agents, the immunity goes down, right? That is the definition of immunosuppressive. So these patients tend to have newer infections, which are more common in immunocompromised hosts as compared to healthy hosts. So what prophylactic steps we can take to prevent these infections from coming up in these patients. But these are additional morbidities which we, by virtue of our treatment, are subjecting these patients. So a uh, whole range of topics we are going to discuss, a uh, very vast topic, and uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions, but the way we have framed the questions and with our panel of experts, I believe we should be able to touch all aspects of management with immunosuppressant drugs. So, so that was a brief introduction. So I suppose with that, uh, we can go ahead. And uh, since Dr. Kirat was the person who came up with the idea, so I think she should bat first. So my first question goes to Kirat. Kirat, asthmatics, severe asthmatics, those who are having a uh, atopic background, very high levels of IgE, they develop a complication called allergic bronchopulmonary asthma. Now, ABPA, as opposed to an acute asthma, that requires treatment with steroids for a very long term. Could be three months, four months longer, and there's a, a persistent stage where it is persistently active. So, in your practice, what uh, steroid are you using, and what is the general dose, how you start, and then how you reduce and maintain in a patient who has been diagnosed to have AVP. Dr. Kira. You are mute, Dr. Kira. Thank you, sir, for the question. And I believe definitely in that as pulmonologists, this is the most common indication for using corticosteroids. Uh, in my practice, I use methylprednisolone. But uh, as per the text, because we are talking about the standardized protocols, the protocols are to use prednisolone in the dose of 0.5 milligram per kg. So there are two, three uh, thoughts here. One is low steroid, low dose, and one is the higher dose. Lower dose, they are saying that 0.5 milligram per kg per day to be given for two weeks at the time of acute exacerbation. And for after two weeks, for the next over the next 6 to 12 weeks, you decrease it. You uh, make it 0 0.5 milligram per kg per day every other day. And then after 6 to 12 weeks, you bring the dose down by 5 to 10 milligram every two weeks over the next three months and taper it. Some patients may need a maintenance dose. Their maintenance dose may be 5 to 7.5 milligram penicillin per day. And the higher dose, they are saying in that 0.75 milligram per kg to 1 uh, milligram per day to be given for six weeks. This is the higher dose protocol. And after that, you bring it down. That is two weeks of 0.5 milligram per kg per day and then 0.5 milligram every other day for the next six to 12 weeks. And then tapering in the same manner. That is taper by 5 to 10 milligram every two weeks. So if you are giving your patients uh, an antifungal, let's say voriconazole, that is any dosing interaction between methylprednisone and voriconazole or prednisone and which one has to worry about? So sir, uh, voriconazole, generally we use, at least I'm using in patients when I think I'm dealing with invasive aspergillosis, but I'm not using in patients with APPA. APP. In right, general, 
so there is uh, no significant interaction between no significant uh, interaction but a particular concern would be that uh, itraconazole which i'm using as uh, in these cases itraconazole has a direct adrenal insufficiency it causes directly also and then it decreases the steroid clearance so steroid also causes a increased adrenal insufficiency so this is definitely a concern yeah so that is an important interaction that one needs to worry about and abpa is a condition which tends to go into remission and then again become I, so these okay. patients do require courses of uh, such steroids as you have described that i would like your opinion i also read that uh, in somewhere it was advocated that pulse steroid 10 to 20 mg per kg per day in abpa to be given for three consecutive days like the typical pulse therapy we do every 3 to 4 weeks in patients who are steroid dependent i would really like your opinion or your wisdom on this sir uh, personally i have never would be like this any of the panelists would like to contribute intermittent pulse therapy Every three to four weeks, doctor. Uh, sir, you are right. I have also no ABPA. Like you, uh, I have also seen a few cases. But intermittent pulse therapy in ABPA, I have not used, sir. And I am not very sure. I don't think literature is uh, available. Maybe one or case reports, but there is no controlled trial on uh, this uh, intermittent pulse therapy in ABPA, sir. Doctor Mohan, any uh, thing you might have read about such pulse therapy? No, no. Not in any of the books behind me, sir. <laughs> so I read this in the 2021 medicine update, and right. it was mentioned as one odd case. So I just thought I'd. So I think yes, that's an interesting idea, especially in patients who are probably not getting controlled. So they require higher doses of steroids from a time to time. But uh, definitely worth it, and we look forward to any evidence that favors this use. So, Doctor Bhattacharya, we are all. treating patients with ilds ipf we know is a disease which 20 years back or let's say in the last century we used to treat with steroids in this century we don't treat ipf with steroids right so that is one thing which is a non that is why when we diagnose ild first question is is it ipf or is it a non ipf so in non ipf once uh, it is an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia or even let's say an nsip kind of picture with a connective tissue disorder having diagnosed so what kind of uh, dosing is advisable and generally how long would the treatment be let's say uh, an example of a typical nsip patient uh thank you dr chabra sir for the nice question and uh, thanks to uh, dr krishna and dr atri for giving me a chance to become a panelist over here and this is a very interesting question Uh, how you treat uh, nsip or uh, interst- uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia uh, with the corticosteroid so uh, normally the protocol wise prednisolone is preferred and my job has been made uh, uh, easier by dr kirat she nicely answered about steroid in abpa so steroid is used similarly i prefer prednisolone and even literature also tells that prednisolone is preferred and the prednisolone the dose is 0.5 to 1 mg per kg body weight and maximum you can give up to 60 mg per day initially it is uh, given for one month looking for any side effects and if the patient tolerate well and if the patient gradually improves in that case you can reduce the dose to 20 uh, 20 to 40 mg uh, for next two months and after that you start uh, tapering off the way dr kirat has uh, told so i don't want to repeat the same thing and bring it uh, to 5 to 10 mg once a day or on alternate days uh, over a period of 6 to 9 months and coming to uh, this that sir asked that how long it is to be given there are different trials are available as just uh, going through the literature so there they write that they have the, the, uh, as per the some of the or uh, the, the literature surveys they found that it has been used for 17 plus minus 12 years means 12 months means 1 to 2.5 years so you give to the minimum dose maybe uh, 5 to 7.5 mg uh, daily or preferably alternative looking for any side effects and all so uh, sometimes you might feel the need to again increase during the treatment yes Yes, that's very important. If the, some of the patients, the, as per the literature, initially there might be around 86% of the patients 
विल बेनिफिट बट आफ्टर सम टाइम दैट बेनिफिट में विन और सम पीपल मे हैव रिलैक्स सो द the so normally what is done or i do is that if the patient has relapsed in that case whichever was the uh, lowest dose of uh, corticosteroid to who is the patient uh, showed improvement say it is 15 mg or 20 mg so uh, say presently the patient is on 5 mg of uh, prednisolone and uh, the he or she has uh, showed relapse and earlier the response was good with 15 mg of prednisolone so i'll go back to the prednisolone 15 mg and give it and i'll call the patient after 2 to 4 weeks depending on where from the patient comes and seeing the response again i'll try to taper off but here tapering probably i will try to do over a longer period of time initially if i was doing it at 2 weeks or 4 weeks now i'll wait for 4 to 8 weeks and i may give a diary to the patient tell them that you look for any of the symptom because you know maybe later on we'll be discussing about the long list of uh, side effects of corticosteroids so i'll tell the patient to uh, uh, see your body weight look for any other problem you are having note down in the at uh, the uh, pad and any time you can uh, ring me up or whatsapp or when you come next time you come with all the symptomatology and then i evaluate now sarcoidosis was uh, a, is a disease for which we did not have treatment guidelines for long which was very surprising you know about 20 years back there was some guideline and but recently the ers has come out with the uh, dosing guidelines for sarcoidosis especially pulmonary and pulmonary with cardiac or neuro and so they have defined how to use steroids so uh, dr mohan can you please uh, tell us more about it let's say patient with uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis firstly when to treat whether to treat all patients and if you decide to treat then what is the standard dosing protocol so i i think despite the ers guidelines i don't think we are very clear still on what is the appropriate dose and in whom uh the it's fairly clear if a person is asymptomatic you don't have to use steroids if a person has purely lymph node disease you don't use steroids a person has significant infiltrates uh has symptoms including hypercalcemia for example which is not very common in india if they have systemic sarcoidosis cardiac being top of the list but also other systems uh neurological significant ocular involvement uh then use and we've seen the rare liver and spleen uh, sarcoid in fact we have one right now it's splenic sarcoid with us these are the people in whom you would definitely consider using uh systemic steroids and the dose these days we are using lower doses when we started out we were using somewhere you know the standard 0.6 to 1 mg per kg of uh uh prednisolone but now i think we are very happy using smaller doses 20 mg we've been using this for several years and we are very happy with 20 mg as a starting dose and over time tapering it down so those are the typical uh, patients where we would start with a uh, steroid uh, and not for every person so almost i would say about 50% of our patients diagnosed with sarcoid often picked up incidentally don't need any treatment uh the other 50% we do start uh, steroids and there's a small percentage who need something more than steroids i think we'll come to that later uh so that that is where the current uh, you know practice is lower doses than before monitor carefully taper down and then decide if the patient is continuing to need long term steroids pushing in a second agent and uh, the dose we usually start with is 20 and try and taper it down to less than 5 over the matter of 3 to 6 months that is a very important issue you have brought up about the dosing and uh, even in uh, uh, my patients i seldom go above 20 because sarcoidosis is a disease which is not an acutely developing condition slowly evolving condition and uh, steroids are very effective if they are going to be effective in sarcoid they are very effective and 20 mg is a good enough dose for most patients which is a very good trade off between efficacy and adverse effects about uh, indications one thing is clear if the patient is symptomatic he has to be treated more than one organ involvement he has to be treated but we come across some patients who have stage 2 sarcoidosis you have x ray abnormalities this is pyrometry showing fec of 65 70% but no symptoms 
So that is uh, an area which is debatable whether we go strictly by symptoms or if there is an X-ray abnormality we treat. So your take on this, Doctor Mohan? No symptoms, but lymph nodes and radiological abnormalities. But only what lungs. I, yeah, what we usually do then, sir, is check their lung functions, including diffusion studies. Uh, look at their risk factors. If this person is not diabetic, not hypertensive, uh, no other major risk factors, then I'd be tempted to start them on treatment after a discussion with the patient. On the other hand, if there are risk factors, then sometimes if this person is poorly controlled diabetes, completely asymptomatic, I just, just sometimes choose to wait and watch, repeat their lung functions, check for their symptoms, especially if they are from my own place, I would ask them to come back every month for a review. And if they show no progression, and many of these patients actually subside over time, automatically, you know, you don't even need to treat them. I just keep, keep them under observation. A young person, on the other hand, I don't like to take chances. If he has no risk factors, I'd be tempted to give him a course of steroids and, you know, bring it down again fairly quickly. And as you said, sir, these patients respond very well to treatment. So you can actually quickly bring down their uh, steroid dose keep them on a very small dose and bring it, take it off within a few months. Also in such patients, it's difficult to define endpoints of treatment because they have no symptoms. So you monitor either by repeated spirometry or an x-ray. So defining and dosing, sometimes in these patients, the x-ray is completely normal. Completely normal. Yeah. So this is uh, one. If, and what I uh, sometimes do is that if the patient can be closely watched, I would rather ask him to come for follow-up and notice any change in exercise tolerance and symptoms. So that allowance uh, is there in our practice that we can wait and watch. So psychology is not some, what the point I'm trying to make. Psychology is not something which we have to just rush in and start treating. And uh, so Dr. Kapil, new area that we have started, lung transplant. So how, where steroids, I'm sure uh, it's an evolving area. So can you just mm -hmm. uh, educate us? about how you are using steroids in your patients. You know, most of patients that you are getting end-stage ILDs, other than IPF, already on steroids, undergoing lung transplantation, then to prevent the rejection and uh, that body accepts. So how do we manage steroids? Okay. So first of all, thank you for that question. And obviously, like you mentioned, oral corticosteroids, and especially you use the term in the beginning, that is long-term is of paramount importance in lung transplant patients because obviously uh, these guys are living for whatever years, whatever duration, 5 to 10 years, you want to prevent rejection. Now, sir, there are certain aspects of this which I would like to mention. First of all, you mentioned that majority of our patients are already on steroids before the transplant. So what are we supposed to do? Should we continue them on high-dose steroids? Should we reduce the dose? Number one, this is very transplant center specific. Number two, this is very surgeon specific. I will give you what practices we do in our practice. Our surgeon usually prefers that the dose of steroids, the maximum dose of steroids, which a person should be on before a transplant should not exceed 20 milligrams in a day. The reason being is more the steroids, more chances of your delayed wound healing, more chances of your stump blowout, more chances of your anastomotic failures. So this is one aspect which we need to be very careful of. Second, just ask, there is a add one question here, just small corollary. You are going to remove the diseased lungs. So yes. the dose of steroids that they were taking earlier, they will not require for that disease. So now the steroids... No. So, so that is my question, that those lungs are now gone. So now you are going to yes. use steroids for prevention of rejection. Yes. So, so the first, because you have to understand that in transplant, the native uh, tucky and the main bronchus will still be there. Yes. The distant part of the lung will obviously be new. So the first part is because you want to prevent surgical complications, you want to make sure that the patient is on a minimum dose of steroids. That's the first aspect. Second, when I'm talking about is intraoperative and postoperative. Now, inter intraoperative, the protocols all over the world are pretty uniform. Whenever you've got each lung and when the surgeon is basically implanting the lung, there is a process which is known as clamping. So basically, that is when you introduce perfusion into the new lung. Before you do this, you need to give 500 milligrams of IV methylprednisolone for each lung. 
Yeah, of course, it goes without saying that suppose you, your team has decided to proceed with a single lung transplant, it is only 500 milligrams, but for double, it is 500 each. And the first 24 hours after the transplant, you need to give 125 milligrams every eight hour week. So this protocol is pretty standard. You go all over the world. This is pretty much what every every uh, transplant center uses. Now, what happens afterwards, again, is very transplant specific. Now, this is the process of tapering the steroids and the long-term oral corticosteroid use. I would like to break this up into two parts. If you are in the West, majority of the centers, what they do is they see the weight of the patient. Let's say the patient is 60 kilograms. So what they do is they give the total duration of the total dose of steroid will be 60 milligram in a day into two divided doses. So something like 30 BD. And then they start tapering so that when a person is going to be discharged, the person should be on approximately 10 to 15 milligrams of steroids. This is what is done in majority of the Western countries and majority of the centers like Toronto. But in our country, looking at the risk benefit ratio, we have to be extremely wary of infections which is the number one bane of lung transplants in our country. So the general consensus is that you do not keep such a high dose of steroids and you rapidly need to start tapering it off. And by the time a person is ready to be discharged, he or she should not be on more than 5 milligrams of steroids. That is the general practice which we see in our country. You can probably you know, go up on the tacrolimus and the MMF, but steroid usually you like to keep it at 5 milligrams. Indefinitely. So the duration of steroids will be lifelong for this patient, unless of course there is severe Cushingoid and severe osteoporosis and you know severe ophthalmic or your sugar controls go really haywire. That is when, but you still tend to stick to five milligrams of steroids lifelong, sir. Thank you. That's a very interesting how we use steroids in specific area like lung So, Doctor Asha, our youngest panelist. You would have seen some patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis now. You know, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a condition which can have an acute presentation and a chronic disease. So, right now we are discussing chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So, once we have diagnosed a patient to have CHP, then how would you start the treatment in such patients? First of all, I thank uh, CCA for this wonderful opportunity, sir. And uh, in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it will be either with the presence of inflammatory features or without the uh, inflammatory features. So the points favoring towards the inflammatory features would be like uh, ground glassing appearance or uh, bowel lymphocytosis greater than 20 percentage or histopathologic granulomas will be there. So all these won't be there in the non-inflammatory features. In case of uh, inflammation, uh, steer, uh, they do respond to steroids well. So here, uh, like a prednisolone of uh, 0.5 milligram per kg per day has to be initiated. Uh, of nearly about 30 milligram per day has to be continued for two months. Uh, then it has to be tapered down to 20 milligram per day in the third month. Followed by, uh, if there is improvement, then we can taper it down uh, to uh, to 15 milligram per day or as much as is tolerated. Uh, but uh, on due course of tapering, if there is worsening of symptoms, uh, then we can revert back to the dose on which they were previously on, or else we can add the second immunosuppressants. Right. So, uh, practically, like we treat uh, idiopathic initial pneumonia, like NSIPs, same kind of therapy. So, so as we now we have seen uh, the use of oral steroid, the protocols they vary greatly. We have seen conditions where relatively low dose is good enough, like sarcoidosis. Conditions like AVPA or uh, hypersynemonitis, where a relatively moderate dose is required, and lung transplant where initially high doses are required. So it is very important for pulmonologists to be aware of the diagnosis and the protocol of how to start steroids and how to bring the dose down to a maintenance therapy. Of course, this requires specific monitoring in the disease since uh, discussion of monitoring of specific disease will take a long time. So that is not in the scope of today's discussion. But protocols and dosing schedules, this was uh, very well brought out by our panelists in 
different diseases where we use steroids. So now, let me bring in our rheumatologist, Dr. Patwari. Uh, pulmonologists and uh, rheumatologists, they often have to work together when we are dealing with especially conditions like interstitial lung disease and some other complications in uh, connective disorders. Now, lung involvement can precede lung, uh, the connective tissue disease can precede lung involvement as is usual, or sometimes the lung involvement comes first. In connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or SLE, we have an umbrella of drugs, basket of drugs, you use uh, plenty of drugs in patients who are not having a lung disease. Let's say take pure rheumatoid arthritis or pure SLE. Where do steroids figure in that uh, basket of drugs that we have? Let's say typical case of rheumatoid arthritis without lung involvement. Like uh, a particular rheumatoid arthritis is there and there's no lung involvement. So what we normally want to do, we start with the DMRDs and generally we give as a bridging therapy as steroids. So if there's no extra articular complications like lung involvement is not there, we don't give to give load, long low dose, I mean, steroids for a long time. We hardly give for at least one month, two months or maximum three months. And within three months, we tend to step the steroid. But if there's any extra articular complications, suppose not only the lungs, suppose there is scleritis, eye involvement is there, ocular involvement is there, or there's other involvements are there. So extra total complications we tend to do more for steroid dosing, like vasculitis, sometimes they present with mononitis multiplex. So there is a time that we give hydro steroids and along with it, not even get, even give second immunosuppression like cyclophosphamide or other agents according to the disease process. But in general, if plain RA is there, mononitis is there, mainly our focus will be on disease modifying drugs, DMRDs begin. And along with that, we just give us a bridging therapy of steroids. And once the inflammation goes away, we tend to stop the steroids. There was a time when uh, in PSS, steroids were given, but now their status is very much debatable in PSS. So where do steroids stand in a patient who has been diagnosed PSS? Even in lung involvement, we don't prefer steroids in PSS. So your take on that, PSS, so what happened actually in uh, like systemic sclerosis? So basically, what the CUU inquiry was there because there was some set of uh, scleroderma patients who had SCL seventy positive, topo seventy positive, and one what happened when they give hydrosteroids to these patients, they actually developed SRC scleroderma renal crisis. Mm -hmm. So thereafter, the guy means uh, all those uh, rules that the scleroderma is a different connected to diseases compared to others like SLE or other things, and where we don't give so much of hydrosteroids, and especially if this SCL70 or topoasmosis is positive, we normally tend to give steroids less than 15 milligram. So if there's lung involvement, and normally what happens, this clonoma patients, more than 60% when we get to our patient, they already actually have ILD development is there. So we tend to give methotrexate, we tend to give microfenolate, we tend to give rituximab, but everything, whatever we give, we try to give steroids less than 15 milligram. So we, we keep something like 10 milligram or 5 milligram. Initially, when we start, we, we can give 15 milligram. But down the line, the depends, like we can taper it down to 5 milligram low dose as much as possible. And we keep as low dose as possible. 5 milligram is... Right. So that is an important time. aspect, especially how PSS and RA management differs for use of steroids. So from steroids, once the patient is on steroid for a sufficiently long time or is not responding, then a uh, question always arises that do we have anything more to add to steroids, especially when a patient has been on steroids for six months, a year, and we foresee that he's going to continue, then to give minimum doses, sometimes we have to add another drug. So add-on drugs or steroids producing agents, these are added. Now, Dr. Kirat, you told us about uh, AVP and steroid. Now, patient who is having recurrent exacerbations. So, is there any role where we can bring in any add-on or steroid sparing agent for, in AVP? Because that is one area where steroid sparing agents are not very frequently used. Yes, sir. So, this is a very relevant question. And uh, I would like to refer to a question that Dr. Tribhidev Chatterjee from Maharashtra 
So Mumbai has uh, posed as well. It's the same question in ABPA. He is asking whether to give steroids plus itraconazole in each case. So I believe that antifungals are to be used as are actually used as a steroid sparing drug. So in any patient who's uh, who's tolerating on low dose steroid, who's asymptomatic, who doesn't require steroid uh, uh, courses very frequently, and is asymptomatic doing well, we don't need. Uh, any steroid sparing agent we don't need i would not add an antifungal when i add an antifungal i give it for about 3 months the first steroid sparing agent i would say is the inhaled corticosteroid when you add an inhaled corticosteroid in a patient who is symptomatic uh, and the requirement of oral corticosteroids goes down and that's the first steroids indirect uh, systemic steroid sparing uh, method Second is use of antifungals. The antifungal that I am using, sir, is itraconazole. I generally give it for three months, two hundred milligram twice a day. And this is again in patients who are steroid dependent or recurrently they are having uh, issues. So it has been documented that itraconazole, particularly I am saying itraconazole, has shown to decrease steroid requirement by fifty percent. Yes. It has shown to decrease IgE levels by twenty five percent, and. uh it is it has a role in the sense that see we are the the action we are looking for is to decrease the fungal load in the respiratory airways but it also has a immunomodulatory effect at the epithelial level so this is one part here i would like to add that uh, voriconazole posaconazole have also been shown to be effective but uh, these at least in my practice i have used only for patients who were very sick who were uh, suspicious for or diagnosed with invasive aspergillosis and it has been uh, particularly i would like to point out that antifungals like amphotericin b mistatin natamycin clotrimazole they are not found they have not been found effective in this regard actually this is a very important uh, point that you have brought out that when we talk of avph not Managed in a similar way like we manage invasive aspergillosis. That is an important decision. Itraconazole, in fact, is probably restricted only to AVPA. These otherwise, for invasive, one would straight away go to if oral is required, drug of choice would be a voriconazole or then amphotericin. The itraconazole is very important drug in management of AVPA and patients who have acute exacerbations. Usually, we combine this with steroids so that The fungal load is reduced, plus it has its own immunomodulatory effect. In the hope that over period the steroid requirement will come down. I would yeah. like to yeah. particularly Other... point out that amphotericin B not found effective. One number two, uh, inhaled amphotericin uh, deoxycholate has been tried, and they found it promising. But We that is experimental. Yes. There are very few patients of AVP who, who have a combination of AVP plus an invasive aspergillosis. So they are. One would have to go beyond itraconazole. The other thing about inhaled steroids: see, these patients are first asthmatics, then they have AVP. So inhaled steroids will always be a part and parcel of their treatment because asthma management continues along with AVP, right? So that is about the role of itraconazole. Now, itraconazole as a steroid sparing agent is only for AVP. When we talk of steroid sparing agents, as we will discuss other diseases, then there are other drugs which we will be using. So, uh, Doctor Bhattacharya, coming back to you, uh, can I just, uh, you know, yes, emphasize that point that just because a person is on systemic steroids in ABPA, the inhaled steroids, uh, the ICS laba should not be given up because many people think that you are giving such a heavy dose of systemic steroids. Why use the inhaled steroids? Yes, As you correctly sir. mentioned, it is asthma. Airway protection is extremely important. So, I, I just wanted to emphasize that point again, sir. And. Uh, The laba and ICS will continue even after one has stopped steroids and itraconazole. Okay. So, Doctor Bhattacharya, back to you. Idiopathic interstitial pneumonia as a patient has been on maintenance dose of steroids for one year. You want to continue immunosuppression with minimum side effects. So, what agents in NSI NSIP we can think of adding? Ah, uh, that's a very interesting question, sir. so the patients as you rightly said those who are either having very severe disease of nsip or who are not showing that much of a response with the oral corticosteroid or they are intolerant to corticosteroid there we have to use the immunomodulators now we know there are quite a few uh, immunomodulators available with us 
and with covid some more have been added and it will keep on adding and we have a uh, extremely learned uh, rheumatologist is with us but with my the nsip is uh, not extremely common and unlike ipf a few cases have treated so the and i uh, read the literature also the commonest drug which is preferred is azathioprine azathioprine is available as you know as a, a 50 mg tablet so initially you start with 25 to 50 mg and uh, observe the patient and uh, every 1 to 2 weeks you keep increasing the dose and maximum dose is up to 200 mg so patient may respond to uh, up to 150 mg a day now the issue is there are some uh, particularly the western literature they write that tpmt test should be done as we know that tp those who are deficiency with the uh, tpmt enzyme in those cases the chances of immunosuppression is more with methotrexate it is available in delhi with 400 4000 rupees but for routinely i am not doing and uh, even my rheumatologist colleague colleagues of delhi with whom i have spoken i don't think they are also doing it so this is the first drug i am comfortable with second drug which i have used is mmf that is mycophenolate trimethyltil this is available as again 500 mg tablet you start with 1 mg twice a day give it for 2 weeks and after that 2 uh, weeks you increase it to 2 bd that is 1 uh, uh, gram uh, twice daily and you may increase after 2 weeks to maximum 3 uh, tablets twice uh, weekly now mmf the issue is diarrhea like uh, what we have seen with the uh, nintadenib here also around 50% of the patients are like the 50% is of course my rheumatologist colleague said i have not treated many patients with mmf so uh, with my uh, practice little bit two three patients i found them having diarrhea so 50% of the patients if they have diarrhea you go back to the lower dose like if you have started with 3 bd you make it to uh, 2 bd and this you can continue uh, after keeping uh, a track about the cbc lft and all those things initially you do once a month later on the patient stabilize then you can continue uh, do it every 3 months and uh, total uh, you can give this drugs for one year and maybe even longer those who are refractory to these two diseases so two more drugs i have used and uh, one is cyclophosphamide of course not for nsip cyclophosphamide i have used for uh, Vaginas and other. No, I mean only IIPs were this. Uh, IIPs, they they do give. My rheumatologist colleague give cyclophosphamide as a dose of 15 milligram per kg of body weight, keeping in keeping in mind about the cystitis. So you have to hyper hydrate the patient and look. Uh, Mesna uh, these days routinely is not given uh, by the rheumatologist or even pulmonologist, but cyclophosphamide when used for the uh, cancer patients, there they do give uh, Mesna. And the next drug what has been given is. uh very took the map uh, you give no, pure, uh, one pure nsip pure nsip pin pure, pure nsip some people have given uh, some just uh, one or the case reports are there, there with the rituximab but i have never given a rituximab the problem with the nsip is that we don't have much evidence not much evidence not evidence. much evidence so evidence that is anecdotal or personal use because unlike sarcoidosis yeah, yeah, found with uh, both uh, the uh, this mmf and uh, with the uh, uh this uh, azathioprine these two drugs yeah. i found evidence the rest of the things are anecdotal reports uh, fortunately uh, we were referring to sarcoidosis guidelines so there the ers has now defined uh, the use of add on drugs or steroid sparing agents so dr murli back to you continuing from where you left off steroids already given patient has responded but not adequately or requires long term steroids so what are the other options and in some cases you might be tempted to start with two drugs uh, straight away so yes, so experience yeah so we have generally started only with steroids in the first instance but more and more when patients come with very severe disease multi system involvement we are tempted to use two drugs and usually the uh, first add on drug is methotrexate i think there's good evidence it's reasonably safe uh we have to monitor carefully of course but a uh, uh, dose of 15 mg per week of methotrexate added on to prednisolone seems to work quite well uh we add it on when up front when we have severe systemic disease as i said when we are anticipating that this patient has is going to have problems and the risk of uh recurrence cannot be tolerated this is especially patients with cardiac sarcoid for example 
where uh, we've, ha- we've had patients who presented for the first time with a dysrhythmia. Uh, in fact, one patient I remember, a very senior police officer, uh, came in with uh, cardiac problems on his first day in hospital, had a ventricular fibrillation. So in addition to his uh, uh, you know, steroid treatment, in addition to putting him on an implantable cardiac defibrillator, we started him on methotrexate up front, and he's been doing very well. We've been able a to bring the question. steroid dose. Yes. I want to just ask a short question since we are discussing cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, if there are EC abnormalities, do you go in for an MR or a PET scan? To How do you diagnose cardiac sarcoidosis? <laughs> very good question and very difficult to answer. So the suspicion comes when we are facing some, we, we have somebody who's got a conduction abnormality. So, you know, you see a bundle branch block. You see somebody with evidence of either systolic or diastolic dysfunction. So either mechanical or electrical clues to the presence of cardiac sarcoid. Our tendency has been to do one or the other first, and the two are complementary to each other. So if a cardiac MR does not, it's, it's usually easier to get a cardiac MR immediately. So we get a cardiac MR done first. If that does not give us strong evidence of uh, sarcoid, cardiac sarcoid, and we still have a high suspicion, then we move on to do the PET. And this is done you know, in two phases. I have some experience with PET, and you see beautiful FDG positive all around the myocardium. And then I tell these patients that you require lifelong therapy because monitoring becomes very difficult for cardiac <laughs> sarcoidosis. Yeah. What about mycophenolate in sarcoidosis? It has of late become quite popular. MMF. MMF. I've never really used it, sir. I think what we do use is, is methotrexate. But MMF, there has been mixed reports. There are some the reports. Guidelines, that guidelines very they tend to favor use of MMF now. Yes, yes. So the, the good thing about MMF, of course, and I think we'll come back to this, is it's a relatively safe drug. It's usually reasonably well tolerated. Many pulmonologists are worried about methotrexate because of the small number of people with a hypersense pneumonitis kind of thing, a drug-induced interstitial pneumonitis, though it doesn't seem to cause the fibrosis that we used to worry about earlier. But there are a small number of people who will develop this hypersense pneumonitis, and you should be careful and watch for it. Uh, I've come across it maybe in two patients, in all the number of patients I've used it. So I must emphasize it's a very rare complication. Uh, So we don't seem to face that problem with MMF. However, MMF is much more expensive. Uh, GI tolerance is probably less with uh, MMF in which case one moves on to MFFS, in which case, you know, I think Dr. Patwari will be able to tell us much more about that. Uh, so MMF is definitely a choice. So we usually move on to uh, methotrexate first and then consider MMF as the next choice. And what about HCQS in sarcoidosis? HCQS, I tend to reserve for people with uh, skin sarcoidosis, cutaneous sarcoidosis, but it's actually a very useful add-on. As long as, you know, the patient tolerates it well, it can even be used. My my current rheumatologist is very fond of HCQS and adds it on to uh, either methotrexate or whatever else we're planning to use. Uh, And her argument is that it's a very safe drug, easily, you know, well tolerated. You don't have to monitor that frequently. And as long as the initial eye problems are taken care of, you know, you monitor, HCQ is a very good add-on. So certainly in patients with cutaneous sarcoid, I add it on up front. I would agree, especially long-term safety, because once the initial period is through, then 200 milligrams daily, eye complement will not occur. If they haven't occurred in the first three, four months, they will not occur later on. Absolutely, yeah. Good add-on. Uh, Dr. Kapil, uh, you of course have to add much more than steroids in your patients who have had a lung transplant. So what are the other other agents you are using in your protocols? Or any difference okay. between Indian and the Western protocols? Yes, sir. So, so obviously everyone has been talking about steroid sparing agents, but I would like to clearly mention that there is no such concept of a steroid sparing agent as far as lung transplant is concerned. The only additional agents which we have to give along with steroids are basically to prevent rejection. Now, I would like to divide this basically into two groups. The first is known as CCI. The second is CNI. Now, I know with CCI, everyone thinks of Chess Council of India. But (laughs) CCI stands for cell cycle uh, inhibitors. So there are two drugs which have been extensively studied and used. They are azathioprine and MMF. Now, I'll just like to go about both of the C. Certain different centers have got different protocols. I will tell you what my center used to do. 
before the surgery there is a role for giving these uh, agents so as a therapeutic if you are giving you need to give for 4 mg per kg before the surgery if you are giving mmf the dose is 1 g before the surgery it's like an induction immunosuppression if the weight is more than 50 if the weight is less than 50 we used to give only 500 mg now post transplant also these agents need to be continued and they are usually introduced in the first week to 10 days after the transplant it does not depend on the dose of steroids being used how do you monitor this and what is the dose that you can go up to it depends on certain parameters first obviously is your tolerability we see that mmf really we have a lot of problems with gi issues because you know post transplant they are also on a variety of drugs so with that sometimes mmf does have issues so instead of your your usual mycophenolate which is your 250 500 mg we prefer using myfortic which is the equivalent of 180 and 360 mg it is more you know it's better absorbed uh, and tolerated by the patient the second is liver toxicity as i have print scores much above mmf as far as liver toxicity is concerned and third obviously is bone marrow suppression which is common to both so you know based on all of this you have to use these agents now remember in transplant we have got a very specific entity which is known as ptld it stands for post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder it's a malignancy it's like a lymphoma type syndrome which is seen exclusively after transplant even in lungs even in liver in all sorts now azathioprine has been found to be one of the culprits which may lead to this apart from the fact that patients who have a very high pre transplant serology of ebv titers epstein barr virus titers uh, it has been hypothesized that both of these might have a role to play as far as the formation of ptld is concerned now the second agent which i want to mention is the cnis which stands for calcineurin inhibitors again these are two types tacrolimus and cyclosporin now they inhibit cyclo uh, calcineurin so that your lymphocyte count is basically kept in check remember post transplant these are the drugs which is the most important monitoring of their levels is extremely important for us and based on how far you are into your transplant the levels will be different i would just like to give you a gross example first month you aim for something like 10 to 12 probably you know 4 to 6 months down the line you aim for a level of 7 to 8 probably be 1 or 2 years down the line you aim for a level of let's say 4 or 5 or something and remember the side effect profile of tacrolimus and cyclosporin is huge the most common rate limiting thing which we encounter in our clinical practice is basically renal toxicity remember up to 5% of patients post transplant can end up in dialysis irrespective of what organ is being transplanted that is because of a side effect of these so all of these are the considerations which we have to keep in mind when we are uh, seeing our patients post transplant so difference is that in uh, other conditions which we have been discussing we talk of steroid sparing agents or add ons here of course it's a basket of drug which has to be given so that is the vital difference uh, so dr patwari again uh, in your practice of course you need to start using other agents along with steroids much earlier than what we pulmonologists do so what we have already discussed about these drugs any other uh, drugs that you use we have discussed mmf methotrexate so we are touching into your areas so and other disease modifying agents that you use so what happened actually in our practice it mainly depends on the disease specific so like as already discussed this hydroxychloroquine so what happens is hydroxychloroquine works in most of our patients and we use tend to give everywhere because hydrox hydroxychloroquine has a pleomorphic effect it works on the skin it works on the joints so it is something like just like we give a multivitamin something like that but definitely there are some disease like lupus sle there we tend to give hydroxychloroquine in the entire life now depending on the organ involvement we tend to give methotrexate if this more joint centric or lung centric and if it is purely lung centric we tend to switch either to methotrexate or to nituximab or uh, to cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate so it always depends upon the primary disease which we are dealing with so if i am dealing with rheumatoid arthritis there is lung involvement i will think of using more of methotrexate mycophenolate something like these two agents cyclophosphamides we don't use too much in methotrexate uh, rheumatoid arthritis ild but the fenomide the fenomide 
Lefnomide also, if IL is there, we tend to use less. But in general, if it is a rheumatoid arthritis without too much of lung involvement, we used to use uh, lefnomide. So similarly, if too much of arthritis is concerned, then we tend to use lefnomide. But otherwise, for lung concern, we don't to use too much of lefnomide. There are agents like anti-TNF. So we use a lot of anti-TNF, especially for like our ankylosing spondylitis patients and even to psoriatic arthritis patients. So even one of the side effects of this anti-TNF is this can cause fibrosis in the lungs. So if there is any lung involvement, eye leaf chances are there, we tend to avoid anti-TNFs is there. So like adilimumab, infeximab, we tend to use less if lung involvement is there. And apart from this, for lupus neopatis, we do use, I mean, uh, tetrolimus, we use microfinet. And we also use combination therapy. So that is very important for lupus neopatis. So just like in uh, transplant, they are using this microfinial tecrolimus. What we tend to do, we use to combine. So like tecrolimus plus azathioprine, tec plus aza, or tec plus microfinial. So this combination therapies have a big role. And also in lupus, we don't use belimab also. But again, in India, it is not available. So we don't use in our practice. But otherwise, that is also very good options. So there are lots of biologics and one of the biologics is... Your basket of immunosuppression is much bigger than ours. We use a limited number of patients. Thank you. One thing just I will add that that we have seen many prescriptions like microfinite. They are just written that you take microfinite. But but we always advise them to always take with empty stomach. So that is one thing which is way times missed. Because we have to write busy in a prescription. Suppose eight medicines we have to write and we don't write on empty stomach. But what will happen if a patient will take microfinite immediately after food the absorption decreases. Yeah. So normally microfinite is something like uh, for before two hours, you cannot take anything and after one hour, you cannot take. So that is one that thing. That is very important. Uh, These are instructions that we often tend to forget, you know, which drugs have to be taken on MFs. Like very important point about MFs. So we always write that for two hours, you should not have anything. So it's like for steroids, we always say that you have to take this with food. So coming back to uh, oral steroids, you know, patients are very well informed. They are always going to question when you're using long-term steroids about the side effects. So we have to monitor adverse effects so that we don't give a second disease, an iatrogenic disease to the patient. So that monitoring becomes part and parcel of monitoring of the primary disease as well as evaluating the patient for appearance of adverse effects and some objective parameters. So Dr. Kira, bones patient on long-term steroids. So how do we protect the bones? How do we monitor the bone health in these patients? A very relevant question. So what is, who are the people who are actually at risk for musculoskeletal issues arising from corticosteroid therapy? So anyone who is receiving more than 7. more than or equivalent of 7.5 milligram per day for more than three months, three or more months, is at risk for osteoporosis. Anyone who is receiving more than 10 milligram per day is at risk for myopathy for more than one month. Anyone who is receiving more than 20 milligram per day for one month or more is at risk for osteonecrosis or avascular necrosis. As per the American uh, Association of Rheumatology, they recommend that anyone who is receiving more than or equivalent of 2.5 milligram per day for more than three months should be evaluated for intervention for osteoporosis. How do we go about this intervention? How do we decide who needs intervention? First, everyone who is receiving uh, more than 2.5 for three months is more than 40 years of age should get a bone mineral density and females okay. especially. Should be done. Dual uh, energy X-ray absorptiometry should be done. If and females it, especially. Yeah? Females, is, yeah. So coming to that point also. Once you have the BMD, you do the use the FAX tool. That is, you use the uh, FAX tool for fracture risk assessment. This tool will give us the risk of major fractures in the next decade, in the next 10 years to come. And this will take into account the BMD. Uh, if the T-score is more than equal to 1, it is normal. If it is uh, 1 to minus, uh, minus 2.5 osteopenia, less than minus 2.5 osteoporosis, it will take into account the sex of the patient. Uh, the let's go to that patient, management, quickly management, because uh, we are running short of time. Right. So, so it will take into account the menopausal or non-menopausal states. Mm -hmm. 
so what must say the important points i feel everyone should take care of is one add calcium at least 1000 mg per day because glucocorticoids also cause urinary loss of calcium add vitamin d supplementation next is the gold standard in osteoporosis due to glucocorticoids is bisphosphonates they should be added and third don't be afraid to use teriparatide i have used teriparatide there but the concerns that you should be careful about is that they say there is increased bone resorption once you stop using it it is not very expensive it can be used like insulin patients who understand do well with it but once you stop using teriparatide you need to go to this phosphonates what about drugs like prolia what like prolia prolia denosumab biologic denosumab denosumab see that is one drug which has uh, picked up i have not used that drug so <laughs> the advantage is firstly it's not a drug of choice we always begin with with phosphonates uh, about uh, uh, phosphonates two things are important one Uh, the instruction on how to use because it has to be given uh, on an empty stomach and we tell it tell the patient not to lie down because esophagitis is very common the other thing is uh, watching for jaw necrosis i have seen patients with terrible pain in jaw and the teeth falling out that sometimes occurs third is a break after thread because phosphonates cannot be given for more than 3 years so once they have been given for 3 years then a break is required for which you have to switch to other drugs like teriparatide you have said and then uh, prolia is uh, another biological now which is being used and the good thing is that it can be given once in 6 months that is the advantage and vitamin d supplementation after doing uh, blood level so calcium vitamin d and drugs to treat uh, osteoporosis these are important points looking after bone health uh, dr bhattacharya Yes, Very routine to give pantoprazole with patients who are on steroids. Justified or only when they are symptom, we should use pantoprazole. Because if you look at the prescriptions, probably pantoprazole is the number one prescribed medicine in India today. So patients on long-term steroids straight away need to give PPIs or only in patients who have symptoms. I do not think if uh, the patient is not on very high dose corticosteroid routinely, I do not think PPI is required. So the complications of uh, uh, the corticosteroid is more in people who have peptic ulcer or those who are on dual antiplatelets, antiplatelets like aspirin and clopid. Uh, then those who are uh, above 60 years of age or 70 years of age and uh, who are on NSAIDs and who has got sim- symptoms of too much of dyspepsia or uh, uh this grd symptoms in those cases the risk of uh, this grd symptoms are more than in those cases maybe pantoprazole or other ppis may be given but otherwise routinely it is not uh, required that way and another thing to keep in mind is that whether the patient is having helicobacter pylori peptic ulcer or helicobacter pylori if you if the patient is too much symptomatic so when i start uh, the, the corticosteroid or as reading also the so few things one has to look for for having side effects of corticosteroid like what are those you do the hemoglobin level periodically and if you find unexplained anemia that is one of the, actually i am working in one of the liver centers so we routinely do it so mm-hmm. if there is any unexplained blood loss anemia if there is a iron deficiency then significant uh, uh, this uh, dyspeptic symptoms and if there is a frank jt bleed in those cases if you have to use corticosteroid there is definite role of uh, ppi but otherwise routinely i do not think uh, you should give uh, pantoprazole or esomeprazole or whatever those uh, ppi 5 6 uh, exactly yeah. so that is a very important point that uh, it's not that if you write steroids the second drug should be pantoprazole yes. that is a very important message that uh, the other aspect is that many of these patients who have chronic asthma or copd or idiopathic initial immunity they also have grd especially patients who have pss you know they have reflux so these patients would tend to have more symptom these patients would require I think there is some lag in Dr. Shabra's internet connection. Can anyone? Can everyone else hear me? 
Uh, I can hear you. Yeah, I can. I can hear, hear you. We lost him. I'm yes. not getting Sabra. In the meanwhile, while Sir joins in, I would like to announce that we have 865 logins today, and I'm so happy that for such an interesting uh, topic, people have joined in. And thank you, dear audience. In the meanwhile, uh, I would like to take the discussion forward. We were talking about MMF. Uh, I want to ask uh, our uh, rheumatologist, what percentage of people do not tolerate uh, MMF and you need to shift to mycophenolic acid? So what happened, like when we see nowadays most of the patients scleroderma, so we directly start with mycophenolic sodium only. So it is more of GI friendly and the side effects are less as compared to the mycophenolic 500 dosage. So in other patients, like for other things like ILD, if you're using, we generally tend to use micro 500, but in more than 60 to 70%, it do tolerates. And only in some patients, it is not tolerable. So our use is not that it is not tolerable, but only issue is that most of our patients get infections. And when infections happen, we tend to stop micro So that is one thing where we have to stop micro But for GI problems, especially scleroderma patients, we directly start from 360. And these are the patients who have more of the GI problem, then we have to tend to stop microfinet. The other side effects we found is leukopenia or cytopenias. So that is one aspect where we tend to it and we normally think that azathioprine we also use a lot because azathioprine is also used in autoimmune hepatitis. So it is a very good role. So you use azathioprine in autoimmune hepatitis, even yes, though in autoimmune hepatitis, toxic. like yeah, like lupus, or they also have, tend to have in a positivity. And we have hepatitis also. So autoimmune hepatitis are there. So normally we tend to use ethaprene as a first agent in those patients. And microfinet also we use if it does not tolerate or there's no. too much of toxicity. May I come in, please? I lost the connection, so I had to leave. So I'm glad the doctor Kira took over. <laughs> well, you may carry so, on. So doctor, Bodley, I was talking about cardiac management patients. So I'm so, so I. I'm sure you would have given a very excellent answer. I missed that answer. So, so because we will be... has not answered, you need to ask the question. I we were discussing about MMF. MMF. And okay. Talking about uh, intolerance. So continuing further because we lost Anything. a couple of minutes. So, Doctor Ayer, how about uh, uh, monitoring the eye complication patients who have now we are leaving lung transplants uh, behind us. Sadly. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so ocular complications, sir, actually, as per the data, we form less Especially than patients who have glaucoma, you know. Yes. So, I was about to just uh, come to that. So, basically, the ocu ocular complications of oral corticosteroids will be, will as per all the data, is less than 10% of the total complications, which is obviously not a very small amount. But there are three major factors which we need to take into, into consideration. Number one, as you mentioned, is glaucoma, which is the most dangerous complication. Number two is the is cataract, which is the most common complication. And number three is basically an increase in the infectious diseases. Now, just a few words of each three. Now, glaucoma, basically, it occurs because of damage of the optic nerve because of raised intraocular uh, pressure. That's how glaucoma basically occurs in everyone. But in case of long-term usage of oral corticosteroids, not topical, but oral, the raised intraocular pressure, the mechanism is basically blocks the outflow of the aqueous humor. So what happens is there is accumulation of aqueous humor and uh, that gives rise to raised intraocular pressure and in turn damages the optic nerve. Now, is that a contraindication sometimes? Yes, it can. So there are, in fact, the risk factors which has been mentioned in different ocular societies, I will just be reading out. If there is pre-existing open angle glaucoma, closed angle is a complete contraindication. Obviously, it's a medical emergency. But if there is a pre-existing open angle glaucoma, it is uh, rated as extremely high risk. Number two, if in some routine checkup, if suppose the person is, has a history or a familial history of raised intraocular pressure, Type 1 diabetes mellitus as compared to type 2 has got a higher rate of developing glaucoma. And fourth is extremes of age. Now, what they mention is either less than 15 years or more than 60. So if you are faced with these situations, you do have to be quite careful as far as glaucoma is concerned. Well, now, the fact problem is that uh, very often our uh, colleagues in the eye department, they tell the patient that it's because of steroids that your pressure is going up. Now, that creates a in the mind of the patient. 
So, sir, what would you do? Sir, but un- unfortunately, sorry. Sir, but uh, unfortunately, you see, I I would like to read this statement out. I'm quoting this statement, okay, from different societies. How prevention of all these is all attempts should be made. to find the lowest effective dose now it's a very simple statement to make yes. but unfortunately you and me know that practically it sometimes becomes very difficult yeah. if glaucoma unfortunately because it is a life threatening uh, disease especially closed angle you would definitely have to give some consideration to the ophthalmologist and in such cases probably reduce your dose of steroids to minimum or you might probably also have to stop it get regular ophthalmic checkup and then you know you have to take the advice of your ophthalmologist a uh, colleague and then probably plan your further uh, mode of or, action or or add a steroid sparing agent or add a steroid sparing agent is definitely sir uh, cataracts uh, is the most common side effect of oral corticosteroids as far as the eyes are concerned uh, we know that it's most commonly the post subcapsular cataract that's a very funny thing what people have mentioned is when you plan to start patient on oral corticosteroids for more than 15 days you need to have a baseline of the evaluation i am sorry to say i am not doing this personally but this is what the the guidelines mention and if suppose there is a development of cataract and your blood sugars need to be managed appropriately and then you have to periodically monitor as per as your ophthalmologist every 3 months month. crux of what you are saying is that uh, we need to work in close association with the ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist and monitor their eye health Use steroids to the minimum possible and use a steroid sparing agent to definitely. Yeah, definitely. Eye complications. So, Dr. Asha, uh, so can I can I before end? we leave the ophthalmic topic, uh, to the other thing that uh, you know we often get accused by the ophthalmologist is central serous retinopathy caused yes. even by inhaled steroids. You know that's a big problem. Yes. Uh, how do you manage our asthmatics without even inhaled steroids? But coming back to the glaucoma. Dr Kapil this is probably a very stupid question from my side but would it make sense to do a drainage procedure if you have absolutely have to use steroids before you start the steroids so you would definitely like to take the opinion and if suppose the if suppose your ophthalmology colleague is saying see because closed angle glaucoma you know there is a danger of losing your vision completely because of optic nerve damage if suppose in time they are able to get trabecular drainage is done so as to relieve the uh, you know or increase the outflow of the aqueous humor you can definitely go through go go for it but all i'm saying is probably temporarily at least you might have to completely stop the steroids and as sir mentioned you might have to go on the steroid sparing and once the procedure is done once the eye is better you can definitely go back on steroids i think special information is very very important lest he accuse you and the eye surgeon of you know messing up things that is very very yes. important yes uh, dr asha uh bring in our youngest panelist when you use long term steroids in patients who are diabetics so naturally their blood glucose will go haywire so how do you work this around monitoring of patients and then management of glucose so that actually here we have to check uh, we have to rely on the random blood glucose levels for the glycemic control so rather than uh, preferring over fasting blood glucose levels also uh, the cut off uh, range uh, under which the blood glucose level uh, has to be monitored is between 6 to 12 millimoles per liter sir so it will be corresponding to 216 mg per deciliter so in a non diabetic you can actually monitor initially once a day but if at all if it falls above the cut off range uh, within 24 uh, for two occasions in 24 hours then you can start monitoring uh, like uh, um, uh, four, four times a day but in a uh, in a diabetic you can directly start off uh, monitoring four times a day sir but uh, whenever the values fall above uh, 216 mg per deciliter then we can start over the treatment algorithm uh, usually here <clears throat> if it is uh, uh, like one if if the patient is receiving Uh, once a day steroid uh, then we will start off with the ohas uh, and basal insulin if it is long acting or multiple doses then here the basal insulin can be uh, so, added once or twice uh, dr asha that uh, management i think we have to do with the diabetes so we can inform the patient that your blood sugars are going to go off the track and you need to see your diabetes more often and do home glucose monitoring more often an important point about oral steroids is that 
the hyperglycemic effect tends to be more prominent in late afternoon and in the evening. So that is an important time to monitor and take appropriate action. Fasting may again be normal in these patients. So they especially require some uh, stepping up of treatment in consultation with our diabetologist. So we have been uh, discussing uh, use of steroids and immunosuppressants in chronic conditions. Now there are acute lung conditions where there are very specific indications for use of uh, either steroids or even a combination with uh, other immunomodulators. So going one by one, uh, Dr. Kirat, uh, acute exacerbation of asthma and COPD, especially COPD, what's the role of oral steroids in acute exacerbations? But in and dosing. If, if, there's, it is recommended to, if the patient is able to uh, get better response to 40 to 60 milligram per insulin in a day, they can be kept, they can be treated on OPD basis also. This is what the guidelines say. But if you admit them, then it is more or less the same that, uh, you know, you give the high dose that is 0.5 to 1 milligram per day. Duration. But shorter duration, 5 to 10 days uh, only, like unlike uh, for ABPA, two weeks we're giving in this shorter, shorter duration. 5 days to 10 days. Day. And then same for asthma. Same for asthma. asthma. For asthma. Same for asthma, but uh, tapering, it, it may take longer to taper. Like for ABPA, for two mm. weeks they're saying. Asthma, if you have to see IG levels, have they gone up from the back, gone up from the baseline? Otherwise, so 5 to 10 days. So we have discussed uh, monitoring and side effect. In this short duration, what kind of complications can we expect? Sir, uh, in short duration, because of high dose of steroids, hyperglycemia, uh, even uh, uh, cataracts can come about very quickly. Arrhythmia. Five, seven days, five, seven days treatment. Sir, it has been documented. Five days. Cataract, yes. And even interestingly, even with low dose steroid, five milligram per day is a risk, documented risk for cataract. For five days. I'll have to that, read that would be for longer durations. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking of short duration. Acute short duration. duration. So mainly these only and then psychosis. Psychosis. Plus electrolyte, electrolyte imbalance. Electrolyte uh, imbalance. Can develop hyperkalemia and then hyperglycemia of course. Is uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, tuberculosis, yes, uh, do they go together sometimes? Which kind of tuberculosis patients you would like to use steroids? Could you repeat the question, sir? Uh, as pulmonologists, we are always afraid of steroids in tuberculosis. In active yes. tuberculosis, we always yes. think twice. But there are certain indications of steroids in tuberculosis, oral corticosteroids. Yes, so just yes. quickly enumerate those. Okay, that's a very interesting question. The definitive indication, which is not so common, is the Addison's disease. There you have to give it. Other than that, starting from uh, top to bottom in head, uh, in case of CNS tuberculosis, particularly uh, because there is uh, toxicities are pretty high, there they uh, prefer uh, the dexamethasone. There are uh, different uh, studies available. Other than that, coming down, if there is a severe eye involvement, particularly uh, tuberculosis of uh, the, the this, uh, this uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, uveitis, in that case is also sometimes we do do give it, and uh, then. Uh, of course, in the case of pericardial effusion, it's a must because the patient may later on develop constrictive pericarditis. And then if uh, there is in the earlier days, the, even in plural effusion, they used to give uh, uh, the corticosteroid. But nowadays, routinely, we are not giving. Only exceptional cases in the, this type of cases we give. And of course, tubercul uh, steroid is a must in, in uh, tuberculosis patients if they develop some severe drug uh, drug drug reactions like Steven Jensen syndrome and any of those dermatological reactions. There, definitely you'll have to give uh, this thing. And the other things we have been uh, taught, uh, like uh, teachers like you, since our undergraduate and postgraduate days, that if there is involvement of a hollow uh, organ, uh, lumen is involved. Like yeah. if uh, the, in those cases also you may give uh, steroid to prevent uh, the obstruction and all. These are some of the common indications immediately I could think of in uh, tuberculosis. Uh, uh, very well described and very comprehensive. Thank you. So Dr. Mohan, through the COVID uh, pandemic, so memories and history, the use of steroids, there was always a debate on when to steroid, start steroids and in those patients where steroids were used. 
low dose pulse therapy so what is the benefit so if we go back into the literature which has come out with that experience can you just summarize hello you need Dr. to unmute Dr. Sorry. Murli, are you there? Yes, sir. So, uh, no, I'm just saying that, you know, if you look at the evidence, it's very clear that in patients without hypoxia, there is absolutely no role for uh, steroids. There is some role for inhaled steroids. Budesonide was used. But that, again, you know, in the recovery trial, seemed to have some, some benefit. Uh, and it had demonstrated benefit whether you took it in the first seven days or whether the first 14 days we didn't see too much of a difference between those two so i think we have used inhale budesonide the study used uh you know the dpi uh and they used high doses they used 800 micrograms so i think india we can protocol, get away with lower pardon sir government of india protocol uh, does uh, advise yes. use of budesonide. yes so that is justified now the use of systemic steroids either dexamethasone or prednisolone. We had various re recommendations, but I think it's fairly clear that only when there is hypoxia, there is a role for oral corticosteroids. And this is, you know, short term, seven to 14 days is what is usually recommended, typically seven days. Seems to certainly improve outcomes. The important thing is not to carry it on too long, to not to use too high a dose. And to stop it once, you know, your uh, time period is achieved and not continue it for too long. Now, this may not be true when you're talking about COVID-associated ARDS, yeah. but in the, uh, you know, the average patient who recovers well, it's important to stop it too soon. Certainly has been mentioned as one of the risk factors for the progression to that wave of mucor mycosis that we saw uh, yeah. and perhaps other diseases also. Yeah, so very important to uh, use it only till it is required and not overuse it because that will give very bad outcomes to many patients. So, Dr. Ayer, uh, in community acquired pneumonia, again, papers uh, do keep coming from time to time on uh, use of steroids in severe community acquired pneumonias. So, any uh, comments on that, Dr. Ayer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, for lack of time, I'll just quickly rush through it. So, there was a very recent paper which was published one and a half months back. This is by the French Ministry of Health. Now, these guys studied 800 patients of severe community-acquired pneumonia who required ICU stay. They divided into two groups, hydrocortisone versus placebo. It was found out that the hydrocortisone group had 50% less mortality compared to the placebo. Now, the dose over here is very important. The dose used was 200 milligrams per day. So, that was 100 BD used for 4 to 8 days, which was used in these patients. There were further two findings which, we, which they saw that the patients who were on steroids, a less number needed intubation, 18% versus 30%. And third, the people on steroids, 40% reduction in usage of vasopressin was seen in this trial. So this was quite a good trial just published recently, French Ministry of Health. So in short, corticosteroids definitely useful in patients of community-acquired pneumonia, like you mentioned, severe. So those who have septic shock, those exactly. who are probably in need of invasive mechanical ventilation or high inflammatory response. So there is definitely a role of hydrocortisone. Selected patients of community acquired pneumonia, one may use these drugs. So coming to our last set of questions now, since steroids do give iatrogenic complications and diseases, so there is always a duty on us to prevent some of these complications about prevention of complications, diseases. So Dr. Tirat, in patients of AVPA or long-term steroids, any chemoprophylaxis you would consider, let's say a patient who has got a positive Montus or who has been treated for tuberculosis in the past, any indication of chemoprophylaxis? Then in a patient who has severe bronchitis, I would like to use a macrolide. And macrolide has been, uh, it has been even uh, recommended to be used up to a year. It, mm -hmm. Alternate day dosing can be done or everyday dosing can be done. Other than that, the prophylaxis would be to have pneumococcal vaccine and the yearly flu shots. But chemoprophylaxis for medicine only, this is what I understand. And, and uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, in idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, especially in our setup, you know, patient with positive montos, because a uh, situation will be different in the US. They are, they are, you know, 
which is scared of seeing a positive Montus. But here, Montus positivity is in plenty. Now, the recent RNDCP guidelines have started talking about chemo prophylaxis. So, what about chemo prophylaxis against tuberculosis in these patients with long term syrups? Uh, yeah, they, they, in Western countries, definitely they will give uh, the, this. Uh, uh, the chemo prophylaxis for tuberculosis in our country still the guidelines are evolving, but uh, depending on the severity, if the patient is uh, very on very high dose of uh, corticosteroid and uh, patient is frail or very elderly, so in that kind of scenario probably I'll give uh, chemo prophylaxis for these patients. But otherwise, uh, for routine patient, young person with the corticosteroid is lesser than twenty milligram, I may not be giving uh, steroid. But yes. Okay. If, if uh, other than uh, tuberculosis, if the patient is on uh, prednisolone for more than uh, uh, 30 days or more than one month, I may give uh, chemoprophylaxis for pneumocystis zero C. I may give uh, yeah. septan, uh, one uh, OD dose and I will think of even for uh, fluconazole also if there is a chance of uh, a fungal infection. Yeah, so these are important. Uh, uh, Dr. Mohan, in your practice, uh, Prevention of tuberculosis, prevention of PJV, any uh, protocol that you follow? So, uh, typically we use uh, cotramoxazole because of the risk of PCP, uh, either a double strength that's or... Standard. That's standard of care. Yes, sir. That's, so it's fairly standard. TB is a big question. We tend to use either a Mantu, which in most of our patients, sarcoid, for example, is bound to be negative. So we tend to use the Quantiferon TB Gold, one of the IGRA tests, and take a call on, as Sir was saying, you know, uh, if we are planning to give it long term, which obviously you will in sarcoid, then we usually start with chemoprophylaxis for TB. That is usually given because uh, uh, quantifron would be positive in more than half of your patients. Yeah, at least 40 to 50% of our patients. So most patients end up getting it. That is also a standard of care. Right? Yes. So Dr. Ayer, in your practice, lung transplant, of course, prevention is very, very important because that is the worst thing that can happen to a patient who has had a lung transplant. So True, what sir. are the standard preventive strategies in your patients? But I'll again quickly go through it so we can just divide this basically into two, infective and non-infective. Infective divided into three. The first is PJP prophylaxis, which obviously Dr. Murli Mohan sir has already touched upon. So the standard obviously is sulfomethoxyl and trimethoprim. Secondary reserve agents are dapsone, nebulized pentamidine and atovacion. The second for us important is cytomegalovirus prophylaxis. Sir. So it depends on what is the serological status of the donor and the recipient. However, we, as a rule, we always treat these patients with valgancyclovir based on the bone marrow and based on creatinine. Third is fungal prophylaxis, sir. So in our country, voriconazole and posaconazole are preferred over fluconazole as compared to the West because in our country, molds are a very big problem. Please, we have to ensure that these agents have got a massive drug interaction with acrolimus. That is something which we have to, uh, you know, keep in mind. Last non-infective prophylaxis, there's only one, which is azithromycin, which Dr. Kirat has mentioned. Post-lung transplant, you do develop allograft dysfunction, which also there are very few papers that azithromycin has got a role in, uh, you know, not make, in, in making sure that the allograft dysfunction does not advance. Thrice a week, how do you use? So 250 milligrams, sir, which is given thrice a week, Monday, right. Wednesday and Friday. So, Dr. Asha? In your practice, you have started using uh, drugs to prevent tuberculosis. Patients were on long-term steroids. So, sorry, sir, I didn't get you. Sir. In patients who are put on long-term steroids and who are Montus positive, do you take any steps to prevent reactivation of tuberculosis, chemoprophylaxis against tuberculosis? Uh, like isoniazid prophylaxis uh, so uh, or else rifampicin with isoniazid. So that is a step So, Dr. Patwari, uh, bringing you in finally because you use a much wider basket of uh, immunosuppressants, especially rituximab. You know, there is always a question these patients are referred to us to rule out active tuberculosis. So, what preventive steps you take? Because in rheumatology practice, actually the patients they come to pulmonologists you know, even they get a pneumonia or anything. So, you must be taking plenty of preventive steps. So, just quickly. Guide us through what is your strategy to prevent important diseases. Uh, Patwari, you're on mute. 
sorry so like especially before using anti tnf like we use an encouraging spondylitis lots of adalimumab or infliximab now these are the things where we block the tnf and chance of tb reactivation is very high so this definitely we screen for latent tb before starting any anti anti tnf drugs before giving rituximab which is basically blocks the cd1920 is a b cell blocker we normally tend to screen more for the this virus hepatitis b hepatitis c virus all those things and definitely normally we do vaccinate our patients if possible if it is not a urgent rituximab that we have to give suppose in vasculitis we have to give we don't get time but suppose if it is planned like for scleroderma we are planning to give rituximab normally we do vaccinate them of one month before and we do igg or the cd1920 count before doing the i mean the, this uh, rituximab one entity is vasculitis where we tend to use sulfamethoxin and cotrimoxazole where now as a treatment purpose like because vaginal disease is there where they told that nasal carriage of staphylococcus is a cause for causing vasculitis so we tend to give very long term uh, sulfamethoxin cotrimoxazole prophylaxis for those patients of especially vaginal uh, so i think we have overshot the time lot of kirat i am Uh, join, I have joined from a mobile after there was a power cut here, so okay, I cannot okay. see the chat question. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, sir, chat? I will just read out the questions. questions. Just two so or three questions. Okay, um, Doctor Deep is asking. We, have, we, we may not have covered. Sir, I think we'll cover the question in five minutes, in less than five minutes. So, Doctor Deep T from Karnataka, Hassan, she is asking that uh, which steroid is preferred in sarcoidosis? Doctor Mohan. Doctor Murli, please. Yeah, so uh, Dr. T P, hello. Nice to see, have you on this uh, program. Uh, so I honestly don't think there's any difference between methylprednisolone and prednisolone. Uh, the only big advantage of methylpred is it's the fact that it is available as an injectable form, which we don't have with prednisolone. Apart from that, you know there are theoretical considerations that there's slightly better penetration of methylprednisolone into the lungs. Honestly, don't think it makes a big difference in sarcoid or any other condition. uh theoretically it also supposed to have little less salt and water retention and work for a little longer as long a duration of action but really apart from that i think it's what you're used to i would just continue using the same if you're going to start with an injectable then obviously methylprednisolone is your choice although no. i find that sometimes little uh, more easy easier to switch to alternate therapy with methylprednisolone as compared to prednisolone that's Uh, my impression, but like you say, there is no real difference between the two. Or uh, Kirat, another what question. What do you mean by alternate therapy, sir? What do you mean, like how to sh- like? What do you mean shift to alternate? Alternate. See, th- those patients who are long-term steroids, then one of the strategies to reduce the adverse effects of uh, long-term steroids is to use alternate therapy. It's as effective as low-dose steroids. Okay, some patients. especially using long acting oral steroids it's possible to give on alternate days so one day steroid on the off on off this kind reduces the total steroid exposure i okay. usually do this when we are tapering off steroids you know in the beginning it does, you don't want to give that but as yes. you taper off steroids is very useful to come to alternate days so you can never go off steroid for them this is a possible strategy The next question, sir, is from Dr. Bindu Kerala Arnakulam. She is asking, "Def lazacort can it replace methylprednisolone in all conditions?" I think Def got one reason we don't like to use it because it's very long acting. It causes much more adrenal suppression. So this is my take on this. I would like the wise panels. See the problem. Def lazacort is it is not a research molecule. I have read. Little bit about it because I couldn't find any literature. You put defenazacort in PubMed, it doesn't throw up any articles. That is the limitation. So I don't know where the information about defenazacort is coming from. It's Dr. very Dr. popular. Was saying something. So I was just about to say that same, but you 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 will not have any literature, any you know documents or statements you know about defenazacort. So, but it's still a very popular steroid being used. I agree with Chandra. Especially sir. after COVID. Yes. Uh, actually uh, I, i tend to call it a non steroidal steroid because i don't think it really works <laughs> i think that that says everything that says everything <laughs> this lab record is uh, uh, this us fda approved for ducine mus- muscular dystrophy other things uh, the us fda has not approved this drug okay. so i think that summarizes everything so dr dr Kira, asked, one more question one more question so dr pradeep is asking in case of chronic hp or chronic sarcoid where patients are unfit for lung transplant Patient on minimal dose of steroid, 
7.5 to 10 plus mmf uh, up to uh, 2 gram i think is written still a sim- still symptomatic in terms of cough dyspnea is it worth change to azoran or etox what is yeah, this would be a patient with a fibrotic hp end stage disease so this is and patient not fit for lung transplant I means person has severe pulmonary hypertension is on confirmation uh, therapy so non pharmacological management that is pulmonary rehabilitation vaccination that is all that we can rely upon no point pushing in immunosuppressives beyond a certain point because we we have discussed indication we should also discuss indication of stopping such treatment that is very important so otherwise we'll be producing more problem for these patients so sir a quick uh, i would like to quickly share that i had this case this was uh, rheumatoid arthritis ild patient had a significant uip pattern uh, um, lung involvement and patient was in a very bad condition one year back i saw him or even on sitting up from lying down position his he have was severely tachycardic and was totally totally bedridden he had been on methotrexate hcqs and we retoxed him and after about two weeks he walked home so that's good anecdotal evidence so i think uh, uh, like i said after one year he came back he was able to walk but he was symptomatic we planned to retox again we did but uh, and he did not come for the second dose i fear he may not be doing well but he was, had a good year in between so i would so, like to get ankit's opinion on this so like rituximab like within two weeks if it is working it may be not because of rituximab so because what we give before we giving rituximab we give them steroids to over, to overcome the hypertension reaction right. so personally why he worked actually it was not rituximab but steroid because rituximab will take at least four to six weeks to work in him and no, normally no. what we do in rheumatoid arthritis ild we give induction like two one gram on first day after two weeks we'll give them again one gram and yeah. that after maintenance will give after 6 months because the effect will last for 6 months so i think uh, we have overshot so like i said in the very beginning we are going to discuss a textbook of pulmonary medicine this can go on and on and on so i think we have covered practically all important clinical aspects of immunosuppressive therapy today so time for a quick round of uh, one liners take home messages quickly dr kirat use steroids carefully look for osteoporosis take precautions dr bhattacharya the lowest dose of corticosteroid or immunosuppressants for shortest period of time to achieve the goal dr morli mohan please so the uh, important thing is when you are switching when you add on a second or a third line agent make sure that you add it and then wait before withdrawing your steroids because as dr ankit just said these drugs take 6 weeks to 2 to 3 months to work so you can't withdraw your steroids too soon be careful dr kapil there is no lung lung transplantation which is possible without immunosuppression for very obvious reasons so it's very paramount in our field but having said that you really need to monitor the side effects dr asha last message take home message you are muted you are muted asha Doctor Asha, please. You're Are muted. you still there? Sorry, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Take home message pre- after today's discussion. Yes, sir. When prednisolone is used for like uh, greater than twenty milligram for two weeks, consider PCP pro- prophylaxis. Mm-hmm. And finally, Doctor Patwari, you of course use these drugs practically in every patient. So, uh, take home message from your side to pulmonologists and to patients. So I think as we should not just link only to one disease. I think we should be a multi-discipline team, and also all the uh, we should assess the patient like all organs. Every organ is important. So all the side effects we have to consider, and all the risk benefit. Then only we should go and treat the patient. I think that message should go. Right. So it was a very good discussion on uh, different aspects, all aspects of immunosuppression, steroids and non-steroidal immunosuppressive agents. We covered. indications monitoring adverse effects management of complications and what we are all agreeing upon is that we should use these drugs only when indicated use in proper doses monitor not overuse we should also know when to stop these and use other modalities plus take steps to prevent any complications arising out of out of treat so with this uh, i think it's time to wind up and i would like to thank 
our esteemed panelists, Dr. Kirat Sibya, Dr. Devayoti Bhattacharya, Dr. Murli Mohan, Dr. Kapil Ayer, Dr. Ashiva, and Dr. Patwari for their wonderful contributions to the discussion. It has definitely enriched our knowledge. I am sure uh, those who have logged in today, they have benefited from our discussion. And I would like to thank Dr. Krishna for organizing these webinars, especially such out-of-the-box topics, which, uh, you know, stimulate us to think in unconventional ways out of what is there in textbooks and come up with answers which are more relevant for clinical practice. So with that, I once again thank all the panelists and uh, say goodbye to all. Thank you very much. Till we meet again in the next webinar. Thank you. Good night. Very special thank you so thanks much. to uh, Dr. Chabra for this brilliant moderation, moderation and this very comprehensive set of questions. And of course, special uh, recognition of Dr. Asha, young and answered confidently, you know, her experience, amazingly good. Well thank done. You, okay. thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.